Third thesis, there will be no class scale. What do we mean by that? Well, classically classes were around these confined architectures. So look, one to 20 or 30 students was about right in a conventional classroom with children. If you were running a course at university, it might be one to a couple of hundred in a lecture theatre and then maybe some breakout tutorials along the way. So there was a kind of fixed set of limits around what was viable. What was never viable was one to one unless you were super rich. Um, and, and beyond these numbers, things be didn't scale well. So in other words, there was a kind of set of um, uh, rigidities about, about scale scaling in traditional education. And one of the ways in which scaling was handled in the old education was uh, the teacher speaking as a format. Now this is in fact uh, the source of this idea. Um, in fact, uh, the idea of the teacher speaking while the students listen is in the measure of human history, a relatively new idea, mostly with mass institutional education in, in the 19th century. But in fact, in the history of the West, um, one might track it back to St. Benedict, the founder of Western monasticism, who famously said, it belongeth to the master to speak and to teach, it becometh um, the disciple to be silent and listen. Now, was um, education in the Academy of Athens like that? No, it was dialogical. So what with Western monasticism, we set up these places where um, uh, which build these kinds of knowledge relationships. And interestingly, it's out of Western monasticism that the universities are formed, um, and these become the first forms of modern education. So the old universities of Europe were originally uh, monasteries before they became be before they came universities. So this is one of the classic um, the classic forms. But again, the scaling issue was you had to be in a room where. There was a limit to how many people could listen. This is the not so new school. Uh, these are three MOOCs that we now have, a lot, uh, that Mary Kalantzis and I now have online, including one about e-learning ecologies, two about uh, various forms of literacy. And uh, what's interesting about these is they actually bring into the 21st century without changing it much. In fact, the old relationship of teacher to learner uh, that was in, uh, that St. Benedict founded around this notion of teachers speaking and students listening. Now, but in fact, Coursera as a form is essentially uh, video lectures. That's really what it is. And in fact, it's the same form going on, except it's become uh, become much more scalable. In other words, you know, there are thousands and thousands of people that do our MOOCs and other people's MOOCs. Um, so one of the things it's done is built something that's much more scalable. Now, our question is, how does one scale, uh, how does one scale richer learning environments than that? I mean, in fact, it's low hanging fruit to scale, uh, to scale education in these ways. And why do we want to scale it? Now, one of the great things about Coursera is that, you know, there are now 30 million accounts and, and our university has had two or three million students uh, do Coursera courses already. In fact, what it does, it makes um, high quality education or, or let's be narrow about it, high quality video lectures available to huge numbers of people and Coursera gives you certificates for what you've done so you've got some form of accreditation. So in one way, it's one of the marvels of the digital era that this thing is possible. But how do we get away from those traditional pedagogies which are embedded in the video lecture?